a great deal of good to be done, done by average Americans who take interest in how to make government more responsive. That's why Public Advocate of U.S. exists. It exposes and publicizes the hypocrisy of what really goes on behind the doors of government power. Public Advocate was formed by a group of former congressional aides who saw from close range just how the powerful liberal establishment promotes policies that defy the wants and needs of the average American citizen. It takes skill and daring to grapple with the power brokers of policy, but Public Advocate has led the way to successful lobbying for a generation of conservative activists. Let's see how Public Advocate rallies the troops, wrestles with the enemy, and wins converts. Here's the executive director of Public Advocate, Jean Delgadio. Jean, how do you do it? Kathleen, we've learned some lessons. I've surprised myself to see what an impact we can have on public policy. Thousands of people have participated in our dramatic public events, and millions have seen or read about our message for America. Can anybody use your techniques to help make a difference? I certainly think so. Anybody can go out in their hometown and do what we've done. The key is to do it right. That's where public advocates experience can show the way. Can we hear about some of your success stories? All right. I want to begin in the fall of 87. The highly respected federal judge Robert Bork had finally been nominated to a seat on the Supreme Court. But the liberals had a lynch mob out to get him. The national news media repeated daily the distortions and outright lies spread by Bork's opponents. That's when public advocate was called. What happened then? We wanted to devise a way to put the liberals on the defensive. We did it with a technique guaranteed to attract media interest. We created a political satire. I have some videotape to show you. Criminals Against Bork was our name for the unique group of demonstrators who mocked Senate liberals outside their offices. Criminals Against Bork established conservative street theater. How did it work? We dressed a band of protesters in prison uniforms. We made signs with ironic slogans about how Judge Bork was tough on criminals. Then we held a news conference on a public sidewalk on Capitol Hill in Washington. Did you get a lot of coverage? Criminals Against Bork made national network TV. We had a good turnout of TV cameras and still photographers. Because it was so colorful. It was a good visual event. That's important. You must have attracted a lot of attention. Reporters are a lot more interested if you can stir up some outrage response. I love counter demonstrators. Here's one left wing dirt ball I played off to make our point. Take a sign. Yeah. 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 Trump drivers are against four. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right on. He can't quite figure out what to make of it. We even put a B in Ted Kennedy's bonnet. We brought criminals against Bork right up to the front door of the U.S. Senate, where they couldn't miss us. Well, Gene, that's quite a story. You sure put together a creative bit of street theater. How did it play on the news? We got terrific coverage. Cox Television Studios in Washington broadcasted on their news show, and many other television news shows broadcasted to their audiences, and we reached millions with our message. Let's see that report now. Criminals against war! Criminals Against Board! Criminals Against Board! Criminals Against Board! Today at noon, Criminals Against Board gather on Capitol Hill to speak out against Robert Bork, President Reagan's nominee to the Supreme Court. In a statement announcing the rally, Criminals Against Bork said, this will be the first time that the criminal element will have an opportunity to express their feelings against Judge Robert Bork. Well, we gotta make sure we keep that Supreme Court, you know, being really liberal. We don't, we don't want the Supreme Court to you know, get, get anybody like work on it, yes, but we please. throw it against us. You know, that scares the living out of us. In two cases, Robert Bork ruled against criminals. This goes against the belief held by some that criminals' rights are more important than victims' rights. In coming out against Bork, criminals want continued, meaningful representation in the court. Killers the have rights! Killers have rights! Just like the boss! The devil! Thank you, Judge Bork doesn't believe it. Representative spokesman for the thousands of criminals released from jails 
thanks to favorable court rulings, made this statement. Gathered here to urge their friends to reject the nomination of Judge Robert Mark to the Supreme Court. In fact, in fact, if Pork had been on the Supreme Court a decade earlier, we might be festering in dirty jail Boo! and oppressive prisons. Rather than being out on the streets today, more victims, more crime! More victims, more crime! More victims, more crime! Thank you, Joe Biden! That's good coverage. They played it straight. You can get good coverage from news reporters if you give them good stuff. Public controversy makes a story. Good visuals make TV. Be dramatic. That wasn't the only time he used the criminal satire, was it? We got lots of mileage from that idea. During the height of the 1988 presidential campaign, we staged criminals for Dukakis in Philadelphia. That made the 10 o'clock news on Fox TV. Good evening, everyone. Here's what's happening. It started more than a year ago. It ends on Tuesday, the race for the White House. Today, Bush sounded much more like he was in a two-horse race. Running as though I am 10 points back, and I need your help. What happened in Philadelphia? Liberal Governor Mario Cuomo was in Philadelphia stumping for the Dukakis campaign. Here in Philadelphia, some Democratic heavyweights campaigned on Dukakis' behalf. New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley and New York Governor Mario Cuomo joined local Democrats like Tom Folletta at a Dukakis rally in South Philadelphia. Cuomo's comments about crime played right into our hands. You can make it appear that he's soft on crime because the people didn't know that he has the toughest drug program, the toughest anti-crime program in the United States of America. Well, some people dressed like convicts marched in Center City today proclaiming that they are criminals who support Dukakis. The demonstrators actually opposed the Massachusetts governor and his state's past policy of allowing some prisoners out on weekend furloughs. The group believes uh, Dukakis would not be tough on crime. What else have you done to expose liberal hypocrisy? In October of 1988, public advocate went to Nebraska and staged deserters for Dukakis and Kerry. Our demonstrators and fatigues made the CBS affiliate in Omaha. The group protesting against Dukakis and Kerry initially wouldn't get off private property. The leader of that group was shoved by a building owner, Frank Ware. Police were called and they made sure the five demonstrators stayed on public property. The group calls itself deserters for Dukakis and Kerry, wearing military fatigues, carrying sarcastic signs of support for Democrats, led by a conservative activist from Washington who says he has nothing to do with the Carnes campaign. And Senator Carnes tonight is disavowing the group. But the Kerry campaign says it's Republican negative campaigning, and Kerry himself says the group is mocking military veterans, quoting here, you tell those people to go straight to hell. You sure got a response from Senator Kerry. A strong response. That's how you make people sit up and notice. Well, those are good examples of issues focusing on individuals. But issues that affect a whole class of targets can be harder to focus in the public's eye. In the winter of 89, one such issue raised a great storm of public protest. A 50% pay raise was proposed for members of Congress, and voters were outraged. Gene, what could public advocate do about the pay raise? The vast majority of public sentiment was already with us. We needed to focus the voters' anger so that they'd make it clear the pay raise would be remembered at election time. Okay, here's the scenario. The 50% pay raise takes effect next Wednesday unless Congress votes no. How did you get the message out? We needed a symbol. That's when we devised Bag the Pay Hike. We wheeled paper bags in a shopping cart around the halls of the Congressional Office Building. What were the bags for? At that time, Speaker Wright's plan was to let the pay raise take effect without a vote. None of the congressmen who supported the raise wanted to go on record. 
we delivered the paper bags to congressmen and told them, wear the bag if you're for the pay hike. Supports the pay hike. If he supports it, he should he wear the bag, huh? He should wear the bag. Okay. Please give him our best. And then what happens if he doesn't support it? Well, he probably won't be reelected. It is just that fear that they won't be reelected if they raise their pay by $45,000 a year that has prompted many members of Congress to pray that they won't be forced to vote on it. What else did you do? We held rallies. We confronted congressional Democrats all at once as they returned from their midwinter junket at Union Station in the District of Columbia. The Stop Thief rally not only got the message through to the majority of House members, but it put them on the spot to respond. The Congress is in for a little white heat over the next couple of days. While this is a more vocal sample of the public discontent that lawmakers would sit back and let themselves be given a 51% pay raise, these protesters are not alone. Do you think you had an impact on the vote? It went up to the wire. Up until the day before, most people thought the pay grab would go through. And come Wednesday, that 51% pay raise becomes a reality. But it's money this Congress hasn't heard the last of. Wendy Rieger, News for Washington. But we kept the pressure on. All the major networks covered it daily. It is apparent to me, and I think to all of us, that a majority of the members desire to have a vote, up or down. Jim Wright folded his cards. But even today, opponents of the pay raise were delivering a 40-foot mailogram addressed to Wright, demanding the House vote on the pay raise. And they backed down, didn't they? At the last minute, there was a massive turnaround. Republicans defected from the deal. Over 100 Democrats deserted their speaker on the roll call. This was the crucial public vote on the pay raise. Let's look at some other issues. There's been a lot of concern about ethics in Congress. What has Public Advocate done to help clean up the mess? We've staged events to focus on the worst of the slimy behavior that has corrupted Congress. In April of 89, we held a demonstration to demand right out now on the steps of the Capitol. That got covered on CNN and the Fox television network. Isn't it true you declared Congressman Barney Frank's house a hooker-free zone? That's right, Kathleen. After a homosexual prostitute ran an escort service out of Barney Frank's house, we decided to help clean up the neighborhood. Let's look at the Fox television report on that. Good evening, I'm Gordon Peterson. Maureen Bunyan is off tonight. A group of protesters marched today outside the Capitol Hill home of Barney Frank. The group calls itself Tart Busters. About two dozen members stood outside the congressman's home, declaring the neighborhood off-limits to prostitutes. Male prostitute Steve Gobi claims he used Frank's home to run an escort service with the congressman's full knowledge. Frank denies knowing about that operation. The group implies that Frank must have been blind not to see what was going on. That story was in USA Today also. The controversy over flag burning created an uproar. You did some events on that topic, didn't you? The Supreme Court's decision to permit the burning of the US flag was outrageous. What we did in response was go to the Supreme Court and burn a judge's robe. A group calling itself the Committee to Save Our Flag took its protest right to the source. At the foot of the Supreme Court, the demonstrators burned a judicial robe. Take that was the message. In Washington, Mike Ritz, Channel 5 News. That protest made papers around the country. Didn't Gregory Johnson threaten to go out and burn another flag? Until we brought the bucket brigade out. Let me address that real briefly because I want to say something about this orchestrated uh, flag ritual that's going across the street. People should stop baiting me and daring me about when the next time it is I'm going to burn the flag. I All the good conservative congressmen were prepared with fire extinguishers to counter any attempt at flag burning in front of the Capitol. We squirted Gregory Johnson in effigy. Where is that Johnson planned?